Thank you, Paul and Trevor. I'm, I'm happy to be back and, and would uh, look forward to telling everybody a little bit more about what we've been up to for the last six or seven months. But before we do that, just to give everybody a quick refresher, thermal energy is in the energy efficiency space. So it's an enormous global market with very strong fundamentals. And you know why energy efficiency? And quite frankly, that's because it's by far the fastest, cheapest, and most significant way to reduce carbon emissions, much greater than uh, renewables. And why is it so significant? Well, if you look at the slide here, you can see that as a society, about two thirds of the energy we use is lost somewhere in the system due to inefficiency. And in the industrial sector, about 50% of it is lost uh, somewhere uh, due to inefficiency. So we focus on the industrial thermal side of energy efficiency. When I say thermal, that's heat energy. That's where they're burning something. So you've got thermal energy and you've got electrical energy. We focus on industrial thermal energy because that tends to be, you know, on the industrial side, that's where there's large, very energy intensive sites. So there's, they're using lots of energy. So there's lots of energy. We can save them. Nice big projects. And on top of that, about 88% of industrial energy use is thermal. So it's the majority of it. They don't use nearly as much electrical. And the industrial sector energy use is about two times the size of the residential and commercial. That's why. And then also it's, it's interesting to, to highlight that uh, one of the real benefits of energy efficiency is not only does it reduce carbon emissions for our customers, but it saves them money, improves their profitability, makes them more competitive. And there isn't a government in the world that doesn't want to encourage their domestic industry to become more, uh, more competitive and reduce their costs. So, uh, you know, everybody wants to increase the energy efficiency of their economies. The global market for uh, TER products is about $250 billion, which just means that we've barely scratched the surface. So um, lots of upside. The next slide talks a little bit more about us. So thermal energy, just as a reminder. So we, we design, deliver, and engineer custom turnkey energy efficiency projects based on our proprietary technology. So you can see them there, our, our gem steam traps, our heat sponge heat recovery units, fluace heat recovery systems, dry recs. So we use our proprietary products. So every project that we do and about 70% of our business is turnkey solutions where we design and install it. The other 30% is where we just, you know, the customer just wants the piece of equipment. And you can see that these, uh, these sustainability products pay for themselves with paybacks of about two to five years. And this is equipment that will essentially last forever as long as the plant is there, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, no question at all. And we deliver our business through an established global footprint. We have corporate offices in Canada, the US and the UK. Our key markets are North America and Europe. That's where we're focused. You know, we, we have best in class product with worldwide application, but we focus on North America and Europe for now. We have sales offices, that is people on the ground, salespeople on the ground in seven countries, completed hundreds of projects across the globe, extensive list of leading multinational customers in a wide range of sectors. And we've had over 10 years of proven successful growth in operations. And then just to give you a little bit more about, you know, the type of customers that we, we, we target. So primarily it's large multinational customers and that's intentional on our part because A, they have large industrial energy intensive sites and, and B, they have multiple hundreds of sites around the world where we can have re get repeat sales. So typically our customers are very large multinationals with hundreds of sites around the world. We're in a wide variety of sectors, but about 80% of our business is essential non-cyclical sectors, such as food and beverage, hospitals and pharmaceutical. And we're delivering you know, a real compelling investment uh, rates of return for our, for our customers. This slide highlights a couple of things. These are sort of a, a selection of orders that we've announced over say the last 12 months. And it, it highlights three different things. First of all, the variety of sector. So that first one, the little can with a fish, it was canned products. The next one's a hospital, then tissue, then a dairy, dairy industry, then a brewer, snack food, tires, pet food, chemical. And you can see the paybacks range from about one and a half years to four years. And you can also see a variety of location between North America and Europe. Again, those are our two key markets. You know, and we're just getting started with these customers. They have hundreds of sites around the world. So... We have been growing the company successfully for the last five years with an established uh, growth strategy. And that basically is leveraging off our existing high quality customer base. I often joke with our sales team. I say, we don't need any new customers. We just need to sell more to our customers we already have. And that's true. But you know, I also encourage them to find new customers. We want to increase our portfolio of proprietary complementary products. And we want to grow our team and our global, global presence. So after the last couple of years, you know, we grow our global presence by putting salespeople on the ground in different territories. So the last couple of years, we've added two people in Germany 
somebody in Poland, somebody in Latin America, as an example. And we want to do all of that, and we have been doing all of that, both organically and through accretive acquisitions. So you can see the results since 2015. Uh, you know, right up to February 2020. So over five years, uh, we had about 30% compound annual growth rate on revenue and 50 to 60% compound annual growth rate on, uh, on profitability. Um, so revenue for the, you know, the, the LTM, the last 12 months ending February 2020 uh, was about $25 million with almost $3 million in EBITDA and almost $2 million in net income. Now I picked February 2020, for obvious reasons, it was in March where the global pandemic was declared. You know, it's interesting to point out, we did see a slowdown even before the pandemic was declared. So probably three to six months before that, we noticed our customers starting to slow down a little bit because things were happening. But certainly once the pandemic was declared, it was, you know, travel restrictions, customer lockdowns, economic slowdown, significant, significant economic slowdown. We all lived through it. We all know. But what everything we do or most of what we do relies on site visits. We have to go to site to design the system. We have to, you know, oversee the installation of the system. So back in March, April, May, June, our, there was travel restrictions and our customers basically shut down their sites. So it was a very difficult situation for us right back then because we couldn't get to our customer sites. So we still had some orders we could fulfill because we were just shipping product. Uh, but those, you know, 70% of our business, which is turnkey solutions, uh, basically ground to a halt. Well, what did we decide to do back then? And this is, this is where the story takes off from our last time we talked. We decided to make the, you know, the best of a bad situation. We had spent the last several years establishing a phenomenal team and training a team. Uh, you know, when we hire new salespeople, it takes about two years for them to get up to speed and new engineers take about a year because everything we do is unique and customized. So we decided we we're going to use the downtime to, to increase staff training and knowledge transfer. And we also immediately rolled out some digital system upgrades, which we had been planning, but we accelerated them to do them right away. And that basically consisted of Everybody in the company immediately got Office 365, Microsoft Teams, and SharePoint. That allowed people to work remotely, to share work remotely, um, uh, and to to uh, to collaborate. We also developed a internet a TEI portal, which was sort of the new virtual office for the company. That's where all the centralized files were kept, centralized resources, workflows, activities, as well as social activities, news, company news. That was all there. And we developed the new learning center. As I said, we've added a lot of new engineers and, and salespeople over the last few years. We've grown our product portfolio. So we saw this as a unique opportunity to train everybody on the new products. You know, often some of these new products or applications was only really known by one or two people. We wanted to spread that knowledge and capture it and transfer it to everybody else. So we did over 75 uh, in those slow months, we did 75 training sessions. We basically had one going every day. That was over 120 hours of, of training. That's all now on our portal so that the team can go back and review it over and over again. So the objective was, you know, these enhanced systems and capabilities, we wanted to prepare ourselves for full capacity and the new normal when things returned to sort of normal or at least to the new normal. So we, not only is our industry caught talking about build back better, we wanted thermal energy to build back better as well. And then we've also seen in terms of the market uh, since June um, and since the first wave of the pandemic, when everything basically shut down, there's been unprecedented growth in the demand for sustainability. We've seen it everywhere. We've seen it from citizens, governments, customers, industry. You know, this is just a few of the headlines uh, that have come out over the last little while, but basically every country in the world has renewed their commitment and increased their commitment to cutting carbon emissions, including now the U.S. Um, you know, you, you, see, you see things like the incoming White House team represents the most robust climate focused team ever assembled. You know, uh, the, one of the first things Biden did was rejoin the Paris commitment. Just recently, you know, Europe uh, already had from some pretty aggressive targets to reduce carbon emissions. They were at 40% of 1990 levels by 2030. They increased that to 55%. The U UK increased theirs from 40% to 68%. And then more recently, I mean, this has been building, but just in the news in the last little while, BlackRock Asset Management, the world's largest asset manager, every year they put out a report to the CEOs. You know, th this is a company that manages $9 trillion dollars. And they're urging all their investee companies to disclose more and do more with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. And interestingly, that very same, same day, Bank of America, PMG, MasterCard, and 60 other major companies announced new um, environmental uh, metrics 
reporting, you know? So this is something we're seeing, you know, very strongly. Our customers have a renewed focus uh, right now to really reduce carbon emissions. And that's, that's gonna benefit us going forward. So what we have seen since June is, you know, a, a, a sort of starting in July and August where some of the travel restrictions were reduced and site visits resumed. We we're able to finish some of our projects. So, you know, with respect to a build back better approach and pent up demand, we've seen a strong rebound in orders since June. Our year end is May. So from June 1st to November, so that's the first six months of the year, our order intakes, the orders received are 66% higher than they were at this time last year and higher than the year before, which was a record. So last year, the orders in was a little bit lower because there was a bit of a slowdown for the last six months prior to the pandemic, but orders in now are significantly higher, not only of last year, but also of the year before. There was some difficult, uh, difficult quarters there. So if you see this chart, I took the $6.2 million in revenue. That's the average quarterly revenue for the previous four quarters start ending on just before the pandemic. So our quarterly revenue averaged $6 million prior to the pandemic. Then when the pandemic hit, it dropped to below three for a couple of quarters. So Q4 is basically March, April, and May, and Q1 is May, June, and, or June, July, and August. But what we saw in Q2, because by the end of the summer, uh, you know, travel restrictions eased, we saw we were able to get a lot of our projects done and get back to sites. So, so revenue rebounded quite strongly, almost up to the point of the pre-pandemic levels. Same with gross profit. We saw the same thing. You know, it dropped during a, for those six months during the worst of the pandemic, but already in Q2, we're now coming back strongly. We're back very close to pre-pandemic levels already. It, from an EBITDA standpoint, it gets even better. You can see, obviously, when revenue drops, your EBITDA drops pretty precipitously. So our EBITDA average for the previous uh, four quarters prior to the pandemic is about $700,000. It dropped pretty close to zero for a couple of quarters. It's now back up to $800,000. So it's actually higher. This last quarter was higher than it was pre-pandemic. And the same with the net income. So net income pre-pandemic was about $400,000 per quarter averaging. In the fourth quarter, we did take a one-time charge on intangible assets. And, and you have to remember that that was March, April, and May. Uh, nobody really knew what the impact was going to be of this pandemic at that time. So we did take a charge at that time, but uh, fortunately things have come back strongly ever since. So for the second quarter, we had about almost $600,000 in net after-tax income. And working capital remains exceptionally strong. So we're in a very strong position, both from a working capital and a cash position standpoint. We're here to weather the storm. We, you know, the next couple of months may be difficult with the COVID cases. You know, they did go up. They're now coming back down, but we're in a strong position to weather whatever happens. And we're feeling pretty positive about, uh, about the future and the position we're, we've put ourselves in. Not only because we use the downtime to build a much stronger company, but we retained our cash and our liquidity. And we're in a very strong position to handle whatever comes, whether that's more growth or a couple of slow quarters. And then you see here the order intake again. So the order intake for the first quarter in June, for first quarter, that's sort of June, July, August, very strong. Some of that is pent up demand because basically the economy and all our customers shut everything down in March, April, May. So some of that's pent up demand, but you can see, you know, even for Q2, we're above where we were pre-pandemic. So we're feeling pretty positive about that. So uh, just that's, that's the quick story, just a, a, a summary. I mean, the stock is down a little bit uh, today. Uh, it was up at about, it closed yesterday at 20 and a half cents. That indicates, you know, a market cap of about $32 million, enterprise value of 31, because we do have some debt, but we have net positive cash. And so our enterprise value to revenue is only 1.3 times, debt uh, enterprise value to EBITDA 10 times, and PE multiple 19 times. Now, these are the multiples assuming our pre-COVID performance. We're not looking at what our performance is right now, but we're saying, look, we're pretty close to getting back to pre-COVID performance where we were and continue growing from there. And if you use those, it's pretty compelling multiples. If you compare this to any of our comparables, an investment uh, you know, dealer forwarded me a, a, a comp chart that they had done recently. And virtually everybody else, you know, whether you, you talk at the likes of, of Zbeck or Greenlane, they're sort of at you know, 20 times revenue and 50 times EBITDA. So we think that Thermal Energy's current valuation doesn't reflect either our proven growth and profitability. 
story and our future potential, as well as the expected market improvements that we think are coming our way as a result of a build back better in all of our key markets. Um, so that's about it. I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. <laughs>